My guest today is Marina Diamandis, better known by her stage name of Marina and the Diamonds. And just over 10 years ago, I suppose, Marina began a, a music career that led to three top 10 albums, lots of hits, lots of success. And then she slightly dropped off and disappeared three years ago. Um, but she's just come back with a new album and a tour and a new name. You changed your name. No longer is it Marina and the Diamonds, it's just Marina. Yes. So welcome and, and explain that first. The, the artist formerly known yes. as Marina and the Diamonds is now just Marina. <laughs> I love saying FKA Marina and the Diamonds. <laughs> um, yeah, I am now going under my first name, Marina, and there's not really a huge reason behind it. It just felt like a natural, um, a natural decision for me. And I spent 10 years of my life um, under Marina and the Diamonds, exploring a lot of topics that were connected to identity, personas in pop. Um, and I just wanted to simplify the way that I function and interact with the world as an artist and to distill what I do into like a very singular message. So the name change has encouraged me to do that and it just feels right. I mean, was Marina and the Diamonds more of a creation? And yeah. Marina is is more just... You. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it was kind of unwittingly as well. When I first came up with the stage name, I didn't really think about it too deeply. I just liked the idea that it it sounded like a group or a community. And, but I was actually a solo artist. Now I feel um, like I want to do things differently. Now, you've always been a little bit different um, in that... Uh, you know, you're, you're not you're not a conventional pop star. You're not you're not um, you know you you don't play the pop star game or mm. haven't played the pop star game, on the whole. Um, and you talked about m much more serious topics than a, a lot of people, and about the industry quite openly, mm -hmm. and about your sort of struggles with it. Um, I mean, wh why did you why did you stop in 2016? Why did you decide you, you wanted to quit? Uh, because I felt like my connection to music and performing had changed and that freaked me out a lot. Cause for me, the first 10 years of my career, I was writing music cause I needed to write on an emotional level, but also I feel like a lot of what I did was motivated by ego. And as it is for a lot of artists, especially when they're younger. So you have this constant tension between kind the draw of being a pop star yeah. and the need to write music. Yeah, and but also perhaps perhaps not just being drawn to being a pop star. It was more thinking that that's what I should want. And actually, like you said, I'm not a traditional pop artist, whatever that means these days. I just need to have a break. But I because I was worried that I didn't feel as passionate anymore. And I thought if I'm not led or driven by ego, maybe it means that I am not going to be a good artist anymore. I couldn't see how I could write good music without like needing um, praise from other people. <laughs> I was just like that part of me is dead. Were and I couldn't very see that it was a positive thing. About your music, I mean. Have I always been intense about uh, it? Yes. Yeah, it was my whole life. It was my whole life and I didn't really have a life outside of that. I didn't have much of an identity outside of that because it was so drawn up in being Marina and the Diamonds and, you know, using my my life as inspiration for my work. Can we, can we sort of wind back to the beginning about how it all started? Yes. Because you weren't a sort of a, a manufactured pop child or anything, were you? I mean, I did, did you learn music as a child? I, I tried Krishnan to be a manufactured pop child. I did try to do girl band auditions, but I never got never got the job. <laughs> so what was childhood like? I grew up in Athens and Wales, um, in a little village in Wales from the age of four. I didn't have any musical training to speak of. And I, I mean, up until I was about 18, I was like very studious in school. Um, I was actually going to go to university to do media studies. And then I, I announced to my parents that I actually wanted to be a singer and a songwriter. And they were just very bemused. 
because I'd never, I'd never sung before and I'd never written a song. Had you studied music? No. At school or anything? I mean, I, I did violin and flutes when I was 14, but that was it. And so um, where did it come from? I mean, was it something you'd always really thought? You'd secretly yeah, harboured? I had, yeah, I had never secretly harboured. Yeah, I hadn't talked about it because I didn't want anyone to say that I couldn't do it. But I knew that I should be doing this because I love, I love words, I love writing lyrics, and that's, that's kind of like the thing that powers my whole experience as an artist. It always starts with lyrics. It's never like, oh, I've just thought of an amazing chord progression. It's like I have something... I need to say or work out for myself, and that's why I write. So when did you start writing a song? Um, 20. That was, the, that was when you began? Yeah, and then four years later, I got signed. So it was quite a fast track process. How? I mean, that, that's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, but it didn't, feel, it didn't feel fast at the time. It was just like, oh my God, how am I, how am I like, gonna get this done? How am I gonna get signed? Um, it was a lot of, Actually, one one thing that I hope people listening to this might take encouragement from, it, there was a lot of failure, like a lot. A lot of going to open mic nights, having a really bad time, a lot of embarrassment of like not singing well, um, a lot of re rejection from labels. And I think because I just kept trying and if something didn't work, I wouldn't get disheartened. I'd say, well, I'm just going to try something else. And I was always very determined. Um, and that eventually led me to getting signed. And how were you making a living? Um, <laughs> I was a waitress um, at lots of different places because I couldn't hold down a job. I, I hated, um, I actually hated retail and waitressing because I got bored so quickly. So I would usually do these temp jobs, doing like film premieres, you know, house parties at like wealthy people's houses. And then at some point I thought, you know what, I think I should go to university and I should get a student loan so that I don't have to do these jobs every, you know, every single day and I can spend my time songwriting and I can buy a laptop so I can start producing my own songs. <laughs> And that's what I did. So I, on the last day of clearing, I just picked a uni, um, which was University of East London, and I went and studied music there. So I did that for two years to, to be able to not have to work as much. Right, okay, but then how, so how, <laughs> but how, did, you, how did you become successful? Um, Were you discovered? I, yeah, I, I was, I suppose, on MySpace. My current record label, actually, they found me on there. And at the time, I wasn't quite ready to be signed. So when I'd written a lot more songs and got a bit more confident, then I got a record deal. So what was the dream at that stage? I mean, what, what, why were you doing it? If you um, talked about this tension between sort of ego and, mm, and needing and, to write. Yeah, and art. I can't really explain any other way than I had a very strong instinct that this that music was a very good vehicle for me to talk about things. The reason that I love pop artists like Madonna, for example, is that they've used this vehicle almost like as a Trojan horse in a way to talk about things that are important socially and culturally and to put them into a pop song that will be played all over the world. I thought that was a really interesting way of, of being able to talk about social issues. So you saw the power of pop. Very yes, early on. exactly. I mean, did, did you have a load of things you wanted to say to the world? Or, or, or Things that were important to me. I didn't know if other people would find them important, but I, it, it, for me, it was a process. Songwriting was a process of trying to understand things that I was thinking about or feeling, especially as a woman as well, because back in 2008, it was a very different um, landscape for female artists. And even just just as a young woman, it was really different. In what way? I mean, the type of female role models that we had or just the way that we saw women represented in media was completely different. At the time, we were still looking at a lot of girl bands who, whose main currency was the way that they looked, um, which there isn't anything wrong with that, but we didn't have other types of artists to balance that view of women. Give me some examples, what do you mean? When you see an image, let's say Girls Loud, girl band full of, you know, beautiful women. When you um, 
see primarily those types of artists in the pop landscape, you compare yourself to them as a young girl. And if you don't see, you know, other types of artists who, who you know, you might actually really relate to, that's quite difficult. And I think at that time, we, it was a really exciting time because we had artists like Lily Allen coming out, Amy Winehouse was out, and they were like forging a new way for female artists. Um, but, I, but, you know, two years before that, it was like the women that I saw on the internet were all size zero, for example, and that was really damaging to me. Like, I really was affected by that. How? Thinking that I should look like that and that that would make me acceptable. Do you mean generally or acceptable within the music industry? Within the music industry and, and likeable to other people. And like, did people in the music industry reinforce that. that? I mean, with the people you met? Thankfully not, because my music was so left of centre that they, they didn't expect me to be pop. I think it was a shock to them when I actually had commercial success, because they were like, she's an oddball. <laughs> How has this happened? And do you think you were an oddball? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What, what, in what way? I mean, what is an oddball? Um, Oddballs are good, aren't they? I mean... Well, yeah, I think they are. Um, just the way that I expressed myself. I mean, even before I got signed, I was being courted by 14 different labels and I didn't have a manager. And I, I'd chosen not to, because I, I split up with my, my other manager. Um, he, he was managing another artist and he was too busy. So I thought, well, I'm gonna do these uh, meetings myself. And um, the feedback that I got and the rumours that I heard within the music industry was that I was like crazy, unhinged, and you know, just all all round like a mad person. And though I have an eccentric side to me, I think I was getting those comments because I was really confident and assertive. And I think people didn't understand that. They were like, "Well, I I need to meet you with a manager. Like, why are you doing doing all these meetings?" And in the end, I mean, it's very revealing, isn't it? And terrible, actually, that the, the, the words people used that were she's she's bonkers. Yeah, crazy, like or... she's unhinged because yeah. she's like daring to be confident. It's just I don't get it, and I still don't. <laughs> um, and uh, why did you have fourteen record labels queuing up? Was that the power of the internet? That or... was, yeah. And also, it's just um, that's how the industry works. When they get a sniff of someone who might, uh, well, potentially be big, they then all start to contact your lawyer and say, you know, they'd like to meet up with you to discuss if, you know, they want to sign you. And, and once, you, once you're in the industry, mm. what's it like? I mean, you know, when, when you're suddenly having this quick success, um, uh, how are people treating you and how, how were you coping with the expectations of the music industry? Mm, it's a good question, because not very well. <laughs> Uh, I found it really stressful. And actually, I didn't really enjoy that my first album campaign because of that, because I was so um, anxious all the time. But the last album, I, you know, it was a different experience, and this one has been too. So it's, I think it's quite a polarizing experience because it's, it's an odd job to have, and you can't really compare it with many jobs, just in terms of not even, not even like, being known or being famous or whatever, but the actual lifestyle of being on tour and traveling a lot is weird. And um, that's something that you can't really underestimate the effect of. I've heard you talk about the difference between your first and two al second albums, mm -hmm. you know, before in terms <clears throat> of how you were encouraged to work with different people. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think has been the overall experience of that and wh where have you ended up with this latest album? So the order, the order if you like, was you, you wrote your first album yourself yeah uh pretty it was like half half and then the second one was you were thrust together with all sorts of superstar collaborators yes yeah <laughs> and what was that like um just not enjoyable there were moments that were enjoyable but again i like i am a very anxious person and i found it really anxiety inducing because i also wasn't that confident in those environments when you're co-writing is quite an exposing experience anyway. And so if you don't know that person, it it's, can take a while. And then for the third album, you came back to being in control of it. Yes, and I wrote it completely alone and I produced it with one producer, which I definitely needed to do.
And that was a much happier experience. Yeah, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And, and so if you got to the end of this sort of happy experience, mm. why did you want to stop? Well, the creating it was nice. And actually, you know, promoting it and being on tour was, was nice. But I just knew from the start of promoting it that something had changed in me and that I didn't have the same motivations anymore. You know, it's like if you do something for 10 years, then if, you're, if you've stopped growing within that job and its vocation, then... You just think, what am I doing? What do I have to contribute? I, I don't want to go through the motions with anything, <laughs> ever. And that's why I thought, well, I'm, if I feel like this, I'm not gonna do anything. <laughs> I'm not gonna put a record out. I can't ever imagine just doing something because I have to earn money or, um, or like satisfy a label. That's not why I became an artist. So what changed? Why did I start writing again? I think it was because I allowed myself to quit. Because for the first year, I was like, oh, I just said to my management, oh, I'm not sure if I really want to do this anymore. Um, but I still dabbled in it and I was still writing a bit because it's not easy just to stop working. You're like, what else can I do in my life? <laughs> um, and so... What's your transferable skills? Exactly, exactly. Because I've been doing this since I was 22. In 2017, perhaps, I fully allowed myself to quit. And I was like, you'd never have to do this again. Three albums is enough. Um, you know, just see what else is out there. What, what are you interested in? And at that point, I'd done an acting course. I'd done a floristry course. <laughs> and then I thought, well, actually, I've... A lot of my reading material is, like, psychology-based. And so I enrolled at University of London at Birkbeck. Um, and I did six months there studying um, modern psychology and um, understanding personality. And I loved it. And that seemed to rebalance me. And I actually, I started to write out of pure joy again. So that was, for me, the turning point. What, what was it about psychology that drew you? I just really like understanding how people work. I mean, was it, was it for yourself, do you think? Were you learning for yourself or were you learning because you were interested um, in no, more, psychology more just and other in, people? Yeah, more in other people. For example, one of my essays for that module was about attachment theory, which is um, the theory basically states that your early relationships in infancy can... Um, really colour your adult relationships in later life. And so each of us has a different attachment style. It's either secure, which is when, you know, you've probably had both parents around, you, uh, your needs have been responded to, um, or you have three different types of insecure attachment. That was one of the things that I really found interesting in that module. We did a, a lot of Freud psychoanalysis stuff, which I was less <laughs> interested about. Um, but yeah, it was a really nice time for me. And it was a nice time for me to start writing again as well. I so that unlocked that something again, did it? Yeah, I think the pressure to not, to not write music was really healthy. And also just to be in normal environments where you're not like the focus of your everyday life. It's boring, you know. It's boring to do that every single day. <laughs> and, and so, and are you now, are you approaching it any differently? What, music? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, even doing something like this today is really refreshing. And I, I would r much rather be doing types of promotion that are, is like genuinely engaging. We're talking about issues outside of music as well as inside than always doing photo shoots or, you know, one-liners somewhere. It's, I think it's, you just have to figure out what you're actually interested in, what's important to you, and then build your life around that and your career. I think it will work. So what, what are the big themes in this record that you're hitting? So my fourth record is called Love and Fear. When I listened to the songs I'd written, it felt very odd to put them on one record. There were 16 songs. I noticed that a lot of the songs could be divided up between songs that were written from a place of love and songs that came from a feeling of fear. 
and the themes on love are very much about unity and I that hasn't been like a something that I've done on purpose, but I am influenced by politics or, you know, whatever's going on in society, even though I know nothing about politics. <laughs> um, I think that's been a theme that's been very difficult for a lot of people to, um, to grasp and to see what's been happening all over the world. We've had a lot of social change in the past three years. Another is... How, well, how, let's stick with that. But I mean, how, how has that affected you at all? you know, what's been going on around you. I mean, if you say, I know nothing about politics, a lot mm. of people say that, you know, without really stopping to think, well, actually, we're all political beings to some degree. Mm. We all have, you know, the vote and conversations and we yeah. care and believe in things, mm. um, which I, I'm, you know, you, which I know you do as well. So, yeah. I mean, how, how have you been affected by seeing what's been going on over the last two or three years in this country? I would say I've been more affected by by events in America, in a way. It's not to say I haven't been affected by things like Brexit, because I have, but just seeing how racism is still present is so disgusting to me, and it's so... It's so upsetting. Sorry. <laughs> We've all cried about this yeah. um, at, at different times. And I think particularly racism is, is one that goes uh, right to the gut. Yeah, it just feels so anti-human. And I, I think we're at a time socially where we've been able to absorb and try and understand what's happened in the past three years to, you know, with events in the UK and America, all over the world, but it's, it's very um, it's very painful to see that some people's realities still involve racism and and misogyny as well or you know homophobia I just feel like it's so it's so hard for me to accept that people are anti human being is, is this based though on um personal experience or the experience of friends or just what you're seeing as, a, as an observer on the media, on social media, yeah. whatever, whatever it I think it's it all be. three, really. I mean, in terms of racism, I'm Greek, but I'm white, so I, I've never really experienced that. But I have friends who certainly have. Um, and, you know, in terms of being a woman, I feel very aware of... Um, of the, the progress that's happening and the changes that are being made and the way that in which we view women as multi-dimensional people as we view men. Um, but there's, you know, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of hurt there, I think, for a lot of, a lot of women, particularly, particularly in how women are treated in the media. I did a post recently on Twitter saying, listing all the ways that I could think of that women were shamed. And that went from, you know, being too fat, being too thin, being beautiful, not being beautiful, wearing makeup, not wearing makeup, having kids, not having kids, being a working mother, being a stay at home mother, you know, being confident, being assertive. I know that men get shamed in different ways too, but it just seems like the female experience is like, it has to change. It just has to. Because I'm not going to put up with it anymore. I don't want to make myself small or make myself different to who I actually feel like inside just to, you know, be palatable to society. And, and I've, I know that a lot of other women feel the same. How much do you feel it affects you personally, though? Because you know, a lot of people would assume, look, you're a successful artist, you're presumably pretty well off, mm -hmm. come from a nice background and nice family as far as the world knows, mm. um, you know, you must have had it easy. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, whether I've come from a good background or not doesn't matter. Even for me, as an artist who is supposedly in a powerful job, I've had a lot of flippant comments made um, by male co-workers about my body, and I don't find that appropriate, but it's only till recently that I genuinely felt that that wasn't appropriate. I always used to laugh it off or be like, you know, you can't say that in a studio session. Um, 
So though my experience as a female has been much more fortunate than a lot of other females, I still feel those injustices. I mean, music is often a thing that people turn to mm. when they're feeling, well, and then when they're feeling anything, to be honest. Um, is that how you want to change the world? Is that, is, is that the power of your music? <laughs> it's such an epic statement. I mean, it, where it's I know, changed the and, world. It, and it's self-aggrandizing. <laughs> but so I mean, I, you know, I, sort of, I know it's embarrassing to say this is how I is. want to change the world, but um, but everybody does in their well, own little everybody way. Everybody does. I completely agree with you, and that's. I can't say that that's my way of doing it because I'm not doing it for that reason. But I think I contribute something definitely by being a songwriter and helping people feel like either they, that they can relate to someone who's going through the same thing or that makes them question how they think about the world, what, what they want out of life. That's always been at the core of my songwriting. It's never been about writing a fluffy love song. Even well, though I love fluffy love songs. <laughs> we, all, we all love fluffy love songs, but, but why, why is it that um, you, so much of commercial radio and commercial music industry is all geared the same way? As somebody who's been in it, can you just explain why? I think people find it risky um, to have an artist who has a strong opinion. Or, or maybe they just think, oh, people don't want to think about that. They just want to, you know, drive to work and listen to a song that's going to make them feel uplifted. Have you been told by music executives, don't write about that stuff? Uh, no, I haven't actually. I haven't. Because I was signed to an, in, an indie label that was inside of Atlantic Records. So I was given a lot of space to develop and to, you know, write whatever I wanted to. But would you say too many artists, you know, cave in to the ways of the industry or the demands of the industry? Yeah, definitely. Because they're, they're not thinking... I think what happens is that their their main goal is to succeed and they've got a pressure to do that and to be in the charts. So I think that sometimes the message comes second to to that. I don't know if that's and fair. Well, it must be easy to get buried, must not it? Once you have a little bit of success, mm. you have to replicate it and you have to do it again and again and again. Yeah, and totally. Like, I'm so happy with how my career's gone because I've always had success but i've never had like a massive you know globally um successful album and i think that's been really beneficial to me as an artist because if i'd had that on my first record i think my career would have gone very differently and i wouldn't have had as much creative freedom and how do you see your journey now who knows i do not know what to expect for this fourth record but i feel very positive and confident about it I think I've made, I think this is my best record to date. Can we go back to, I don't want to make you cry again, but can we go back to America? <laughs> yes. Um, you know, because it was interesting that you said America was, was the thing that kind of had got you thinking more. And obviously, um, you know, your, your, your single about Hollywood and mm. the line in that about yeah. being obsessed with America <laughs> yeah. is obviously something that you felt for, for a while. I mean, where, was that referring to anything in particular? Um... I think probably that was referring to tabloid culture at the time and American celebrities. But that formed part of um, social commentary in my songwriting, and that's something that's, that's always been there. So... What do you mean by tabloid culture? Just flesh it out a bit. Again, it's going back to how women were documented in media and seeing, you know, these, like, size zero tabloid headlines or, like, I don't know, with... with Artists like Lily Allen, she was always in the tabloids. Um, it felt like something was changing and I wanted to write about that because we have this image of Hollywood being very glamorous and perfect as it you know, is in the movies. And I wanted to talk about how that wasn't the case for me. That's not how I saw things. I don't see things in a fan fantasy way. I want to see things for how they really are. Um, can I ask you about Wales and how big a, how big a thing Wales is in your life? Because, I mean, you, when you say you grew up in Wales, what was your growing up in Wales like? Because you don't sound very Welsh, apart from I anything don't. else. I don't. I know. I'm so sad. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever? I did, yeah. Yeah, up until I was about 11, and then I went to um, a girls' school and started to, I think, adjust my accent, really, so that I fit in a bit more. As, Where was the school? Um, Haberdashers in right. Monmouth. Um, 
and also I was surrounded by a lot of girls who come from affluent backgrounds. They, you know, spoke a bit more eloquently. And so I just started to change my accent to fit in, I think. But after that, I moved to Greece when I was 16. So I then went to an international school. So my accent just became whatever. <laughs> Just like a nondescript accent. So what is your identity then? So my identity is Greek-Welsh. Um, and... In that order? Yeah, I would, I would... Well, there's no order, really. But I think because I haven't spent as much time in Greece, sometimes I feel like I, I want to explore that side a bit more. So I always say Greek-Welsh. But the fact is that I've, I've lived in Wales for much of my life in a... Um, in a market town called Abergavenny. It's very beautiful, quiet. Um, but my Greek side has really influenced me. The culture there is really rich and the music there melodically is very rich. So that's also influenced my music a lot too. Is it your mother or father? Who's... It's my dad, so, right. yeah. And so have you got a big Greek family yeah. there that, that, you're, that you see and are in touch with? Yes, yeah. I do, yeah. I think my fiery, like, passionate side, for sure. But I think a lot of my creative side comes from my Greek side, too. And so where, where do you feel about Europe and Brexit and all of that as a, as a Greek, Welsh it's, person? It's just tragic. That's how it feels to me. It feels like it shouldn't have happened. It is strange being dual nationality, because you always feel slightly torn either way, wherever you are. I mean, how do you, how do you, I mean, what, what, what we've seen over this last couple of years here is this sort of rise of, of, of you know, the small end nationalism. Mm. Um, and not necessarily, I don't mean nasty nationalism, mm. but that has just generally been a sort of a, a bigger sense of being British and Britain standing on its own and Britain yeah, going off and, and doing its own thing. Yeah, and this kind of us and them kind of mentality. Are you able to join, you're not able to join in with that at all then? No, no. I don't feel that way at all. I don't feel... Whatever British means, at the moment, I don't feel it. And I, I hope that doesn't sound harsh. I wonder if other people feel the same. I am British, but I don't feel it because I don't relate to, it, to like, what it's, it's, it's starting to mean. What do you feel it's starting to mean? That we're, like, excluding people. Again, it comes back to this anti-human thing. And it feels, it feels extremely wrong. Do you think we will end up coming back? And do you think these things are I, cyclical? I hope so. I do think they're cyclical. I really do. And I think that's why it's been so difficult the past three or four years, um, because what we're experiencing is like a seismic shift in culture. And when that happens, there's always going to be people who don't want culture to change. And so I'd like... I'd like to think this is why these acts of violence and hatred are happening um, and why people seem to be regressing as opposed to progressing. So I really hope that in two generations, it's going to be a different story, but I just I can't <laughs> tell you. So you're going out on tour well. Uh, as well soon, aren't you? I mean, uh, is this, yeah, I, is the, I mean, are you taking a message out with you of sort of the love and unity bit, um, if you like? I don't know. Is that going to be part of the show? I, um, no, I think there's a strong nature theme to my show. And also, I don't feel like I can talk about these things all the time. And it's, you know, if I'm asked about it, I'm happy to talk about it, but it's also not my place to ram it down people's throats. I think my music, as like <laughs> cliches as this sounds, it does speak for itself. And I put a lot of my thoughts into music because I am a slower thinker. I think about things slowly and then I make a song and that's how I like to present my ideas. So it's more difficult for me to talk about these things in person. <laughs> so I probably won't be chatting about it when I'm on the road, but um, but yeah, I do have a tour coming up. I'm playing Royal Albert Hall on 3rd of May and I've got, I think, five more dates in the UK, in and around the UK. I mean, I want, I want, you went to the Oxford Union and spoke yes. to students there and, 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 you know, and I watched you there talking about how you thought, you know, that the power of music was to be a sort of social commentary on the time. Mm. Um, is that what you're doing? I mean, do, do you think your new record tells us something about where we are right, 
right now. I do, but I definitely didn't do it on purpose. Again, it, I'm not really in charge of what I want to write. The idea just comes and then what comes up and I, and I do usually think about things for about a month. So I might write down a line and then a month later I'll come back with a better informed um, perspective on it and I write about it. So it's, I, you know, I wouldn't go as far as saying this is like a political record, but there are songs on there that definitely reflect what we are experiencing. Um, and what's happened to your, your following? Has your following stayed loyal? Yeah. Because cause your, <laughs> cause your albums, you, you, you sold albums without huge amounts of promotion mm -hmm. and airplay yeah. on the radio because you had this very loyal following. Exactly. Are they, are they still there? Are, I mean, are, and are they still diamonds? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're still there. I mean, they seem to be online because that's a, a good gauge for when I communicate with them. You know, even, for example, with having time off, I haven't felt pressured to come back at all, like at all. And I think my fans appreciate that because the reason they've connected with me is not because I'm in magazines every day. It's because my music has said something to them and it's spoken to them. So, I, I mean, I hope that... <laughs> I hope they're still there. I'm pretty sure they are. They're waiting, very impatient. Well, you'll find out pretty soon. Won't yeah, you? yeah. I, I know they're impatient. <laughs> they're like, where's the damn album? <laughs> I do like to ask everybody if they've got a sort of a, a slightly far out way of changing the world um, that they know would be hard to hard to deliver or mm. maybe impossible. I don't know whether you have any kind of the world according to Marina God, a far, things a that far you know if you could out. change things and make them a certain way. What would it be? I did have an idea recently. I was like, what if when you travel to another country, you immediately started speaking the language of the country as soon as you crossed the border? Like, you you know, you had some chip in your brain that 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 would probably help a lot because you'd be able to understand people's points of view, people that you might, you know, not be able to connect to otherwise. So that's my way of half changing the world. <laughs> Well, Marina, thank you very much indeed for thank coming in so to share much. your ways to change the world. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, and the album is out... It's out on the 26th of April, Love and Fear. Brilliant. Well, good luck with it. Thank you thank so much. Thank you very much, much for coming in. Thank you.